Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Ross Meyerhoff, and Dr. Meyerhoff is a laryngologist affiliated <coughs> with multiple hospitals in this area, including Henry Ford West Bloomfield and the uh, Henry Ford Hospital. He received his medical degree from Stony Brook University Health Science Center uh, School of Medicine, and he offers a complete spectrum of medical and surgical management of diseases of the, of the larynx or the voice box, and certainly related structures as well. So, Dr. Meyerhoff. I want to express my appreciation for the invitation and really um, talk about you know, how much this organization means to us as healthcare professionals and uh, I think to all of you here. Um, you know, most of our speaking engagements are professional societies where we're speaking to you know, other uh, physicians and speech pathologists, and this really grounds us. You know, we, we are meeting with patients and hearing uh, patient stories, and it really is a, a reminds us why we do what we do, and really the resources provided uh, are great. At all direct all my patients to the website, um, and now that the scope has uh, you know, expanded beyond uh, dystonias and tremors and, and similar things, I think it's, it's only going to be a great boon for our patients. So, thanks again. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the patient voice and voice disorders, uh, how to work with your team uh, in developing a treatment plan. So I uh, don't know how important this is, but no, no disclosures. Um, the objectives uh, today will be to define shared decision making, to identify who the members of the, oh, is, <clears throat> um, identify members of the voice healthcare team, learn some tips to get the most out of a visit with your team, and to identify some resources to help patients engage with the healthcare team. So, uh, just start to talk about categories of uh, voice disorders. It's not a comprehensive list, but it helps to guide where we're going with this. And um, you know, I'm not going to belabor this because that was uh, already addressed. And really, the idea is just thinking about what could possibly go be going on. I don't know if it's my. Were you? You're, Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if it's my jack or it was the... Uh, no. Apologize. So good. So uh, where category, categorizing voice conditions really becomes more relevant here is whether this is a primary voice disorder or a secondary voice disorder. Now, this is not a, um, you know, a universally accepted term. It's more something about you know, terminology that I've uh, come up with based on other conditions just thinking about what's the main problem? What are we focusing on? So by this definition, routine spasmodic dysphonia would be, I would consider that to be a primary voice disorder in terms of what is the main problem, even though it's really a neurologic disorder. So with a primary voice disorder, uh, what we mean is the voice is the main problem. Primary goal of treatment is to improve the voice. And that's thinking, well, if the patient's not bothered by the voice, then we don't necessarily need to do any treatment, uh, as opposed to a voice problem that's caused by something else, like an infection, a tumor, a neurologic condition. And a lot of times, the testing and the treatment is driven by the underlying problem, not the voice specifically. But helping the voice may complement the primary condition's management. Um, but the common theme is that treating a voice problem can greatly improve somebody's quality of life. Um, but also it's very patient-driven. So that leads us into 
the uh, concept of shared decision making. Uh, so what is shared decision making? Uh, so there are many definitions um, in one of the um, big publications uh, going over this is defined as uh, a process in which healthcare professionals, patients, and their caregivers relate to and influence each other as they collaborate in making decisions about a patient's health. Now, honestly, I think the term shared decision making is an excellent one and probably as descriptive as any wordy definition. And it's fairly ironic that this is part of a broader initiative towards health literacy, yet much of the literature is complicated, wordy definitions when I think most people know what we mean when we say shared decision making. It, it is what it says it is. So what is it not? So it's not me telling you what to do. Uh, the old school you know, paternalistic medicine um, that doesn't exist now, or at least should not, should not exist. It's also not you telling me what to do. Um, it sounds a little bit odd, uh, but uh, it's rare, but it's not unheard of for a patient to come in saying they want something very specific done. And um, that's also not the right thing, because if we come in just doing something that someone comes in saying, I want this, period, um, but that's not what I would necessarily be recommending, well, that's a recipe for a suboptimal result. Here's where it gets a little dicey. It's also not doing what I do for myself or my spouse or my child or parent or friend. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, not often, but people do ask that. And that's really not a question I can answer because I'm just getting to know you. Um, your goals and your values may not be the same as somebody else. So um, you know, certainly it's, it's not always going to be applicable what I might do or what my family member might do. So why is shared decision making important? Well, you know, medical treatment for voice is really patient driven. Um, you know, it's, we're not typically dealing with life threatening conditions, but also not, you know, we're all here for a reason. We fully recognize that these are extraordinarily important issues for people, uh, significant effect on social interaction, employment, quality of life overall, just um, even as people get older, being able to communicate uh, helps keep their cognition up. Um, so, um, but that all said, if somebody chooses to do less than most people in their situation might, uh, as far as treatment, that's fine too. Um, so, oh, did that not? There we, there we go. So, um, and I know Dr. Rubin had uh, something similar, and uh, we did not collaborate on it. But in both cases, notice this is a common theme among us. What's in the center? The patient. Uh, so, who else is involved? Well, the healthcare team, which is typically a laryngologist and a speech pathologist. Sometimes, certainly the primary care and other specialists as needed. And then there are close relations, significant other, parent, child, sibling. And then there's others, depending on the person and situation, um, a voice teacher, uh, their uh, employer or coworkers, because it's going to affect their work, um, their students, if they're a teacher, their case manager, if they've had head trauma or something like that. And, uh, need to work with a case manager. They're a lawyer sometimes. Sometimes, you know, especially with this group, online or in-person support communities. And that person that you heard about once that had something done that seemed like a good idea, well, sometimes that is someone that gets involved. So the primary voice care team is the laryngologist and the speech, uh, speech line pathologist with a voice specialty. So. Um, just to reiterate, you know, a, a laryngologist is an otolaryngologist or ear, nose, and throat doctor with advanced training or interest in conditions of the larynx and surrounding structures, and typically we deal with voice, airway, and swallowing disorders. And after medical school, uh, getting an MD or DO, uh, those five years of residency training in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and then one, usually one to two years of fellowship in laryngology. 
Uh, speech language pathology is a master's degree and a certificate of clinical competency. You'll see the CCC after a lot of their names. Um, and that's after a clinical fellowship year. Um, and SLPs can work in a variety of settings, but um, what we're talking about is a medical SLP that focuses specifically on voice, sometimes in combination with other upper airway uh, disorders. Uh, and typically the team will work together in some way, shape, or form. Uh, a lot of us will uh, work in interdisciplinary clinics where we're seeing patients together. Um, but that's not universal. Um, every, every place does it a little differently. Um, but it's important to have a team that is able to communicate with each other, collaborate, and um, work with you on your care. So leading into a visit, uh, we're uh, going to talk about what are ways that you can prepare. Um, don't assume that all the records will have been received. Um, unfortunately, despite all the advances in IT, healthcare really lags behind because different vendors aren't really playing that well with each other. And we rely a lot on facts, which is kind of like the equivalent of me using actual slides and a slide projector for this. But that's where we're at. Um, it's the only place you'll find a fax is in the same building as a super high-tech PET scanner or something like that. So. You know, it is what it is right now. Uh, so it's important what you can do to advocate yourself is to gather any important medical records, um, get discs with imaging if that's relevant, um, an up-to-date list of medications or just bring in the actual bottles because if we're going to be prescribing medications or considering procedures, we need to know what you are using now. Sometimes there are interactions or, for example, if you're on a blood thinner, it's very important if we're considering a procedure. Um, also prepare by thinking about what your goals are for the visit so that you already have an idea of what you want out of the visit. Similar to you know, us listening to the voice before we look, well, before you come in, think about, well, what do I, what questions do I have? What do I want to know when the visit's over? Uh, and part of that can be preparing a list of questions. Uh, so the voice evaluation uh, already reviewed, but basically we'll, um, some overlap, but the laryngologist is focused more on the medical aspect. What's the condition? What are some associated medical issues? Um, we got into some social history uh, in terms of employment, substance use, of things like that. Um, we do a head and neck exam, uh, including a cranial nerve exam. Uh, and then the other assessments would typically be the video stroboscopy, and then uh, sometimes, as appropriate, ordering tests. Uh, and the speech pathologist will often focus more on how someone uses the voice, how life is affected by the voice, um, and what are ways that uh, the day-to-day -day life can interact with the voice use. The examination is uh, often an auditory perceptual examination, um, which essentially is listening to the voice, but oh, was it? thank you. Is that OK? I will lean in. Um, the uh, auditory perceptual evaluation is essentially one of several systematic ways of listening to the voice and grading it, um, but essentially is based on the subjective uh, way that uh, one hears the voice. Uh, sometimes an oral mechanism exam for neurologic conditions to see if there's anything in the mouth and surrounding areas that might be affecting their articulation in particular, um, but also swallowing, uh, can, that can be an element there as well. Um, speech pathologists also perform video stroboscopy and sometimes do uh, acoustic and aerodynamic measurements of the voice. Um, and will often do uh, trial therapy to see if patient is stimulable, meaning that they uh, will show maybe moments of clarity during some trial exercises that's a sign that someone's more likely to do well with voice therapy than if everything you try is not really working. And at the conclusion of the visit, there will be some sort of assessment and plan. So is there a diagnosis? Uh, and the diagnosis, while it's often arrived at jointly um, from a 
scope of practice uh, perspective, it is the physician that provides the diagnosis. Um, and we would be discussing the diagnosis itself and then medical and or surgical options as appropriate. And the speech pathologist often will educate the patient more on um, how the voice is functioning in relation to their problem and discuss the role for voice therapy. Uh, and then we'll talk about is, is more testing needed. Uh, and sometimes, actually, response to voice therapy over a few sessions is the test. What's the most important tool for shared decision making? Oh, questions. So strategies, uh, again, questions are the most important thing, and they come in different uh, shapes and forms. Uh, so something coming from us often will uh, initially be uh, a category of questionnaires called patient reported outcome measures. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen these. Uh, actually, the voice handicapped index and the voice related quality of life are the two most commonly used ones, and they were both developed nearby, uh, VHI at Henry Ford and VRQOL at University of Michigan. Um, and uh, the idea of these is that the questionnaires relate to a patient's experience with their voice problem in a short time of interval. We usually look around about two weeks that we ask a patient to think about when filling this out. And you know there's a balance between paperwork overload for the patient and um, providing the information we need. But if these are given to you, I would encourage you to fill them out. They are useful both to prompt us and understanding how much something's affecting you, but also looking over time helps us to understand how did you respond to treatment or how are things going for you. If things are getting worse, maybe we need to change our treatment approach a little bit. Um, and if things are getting better, sometimes people can still be frustrated, but looking back on it, well, if your scores are getting better, sometimes people forget how bad they were a few years ago or a few months ago uh, when it's been a while, and so it helps to keep people on track. Some particular questions that a lot of us would ask uh, is, uh, that help us to gauge you know, what you want from us a little bit is um, how is this problem affecting you? Uh, and then we also just ask what is most important or concerning to you? Sometimes somebody comes in, say, I, you know, I don't use my voice much, it doesn't really bother me, I want to make sure I don't have cancer. That's probably not this group because you're here because you're obviously your voice is very important to you and it's been quite troublesome, but we see those. And that is a different type of counseling than if somebody is, well, I can't work because my voice is a problem, we are, we're going to arrive at different treatment options and just change how we talk to somebody because of those answers. Uh, understanding the goal for today's visit uh, can be helpful. And sometimes we'll ask something about, you know, what are you going to tell your friend about the results of today's visit? And that's to get you to reframe it in your mind and make sure that it helps us make sure that you understood it. Um, now, to be honest, that is this gold standard. It's something we all try to work towards, is, is getting the patient to repeat back what we just told them in their own words. But you've all been to doctor's offices, uh, not just laryngology offices, but others, and we don't have as much time as we want. And it's where you initiating some of that can actually help you engage the team more. Uh, so I apologize that this is a bit of a busy slide, but this is actually meant for you to refer to. Uh, feel free to take a picture of the slide or refer to it. Uh, we'll share it later. Uh, on the left is the um, American or the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, 10 Most Important Questions. Um, and this is not specific to voice. This is useful for any medical visit. Um, you know, they don't all apply to every visit, but these are questions that you should have in mind um, when determining a plan. And then on the right are a few additional ones I came up with, uh, you know, some uh, voice specific, like what can I expect my voice recovery to be like? Um, so that you can set up realistic goals. That's something you may want to know. Uh, when can I give a presentation or sing or teach? Uh, one thing that's really important 
is, is this time sensitive? Uh, like Dr. Rubin showed, there are certain conditions that, well, if we get to sooner, we can intervene before it gets worse, even a very benign condition. Um, but there are certain conditions, like, say, a long-standing paralyzed vocal fold or spasmodic dysphonia, where intervening right now is to help you feel better right now. But you don't really lose much by waiting if you decide, I'm not ready to do anything now or I have other priorities. Uh, and so just asking what's the time sensitivity of this can be very useful. If you're having a hard time deciding, ask, you know, can I talk to family and ask you follow-up questions after? Should I consider a second opinion? And um, I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure everyone agrees with me. We are not offended if somebody gets a second opinion. Um, and don't feel like you're going to um, burn bridges if that's done, just being open. and. Um, one of my uh, staff, when I was a, a resident, said, if, if somebody tells you not to get a second opinion, run the other way. Um, you, know, you don't always need that, but it's, it's, it's better to have that um, confidence going into any treatment if you're on the fence. Um, and uh, thinking about broad options, you want to ask, really, what are your options? Voice treatment comes in many shapes and forms. Um, with most situations, we're probably using about two or more of these bubbles. Um, but ask what, what the options are. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Tell us if you have specific concerns. You have a family member with cancer that you have to take care of, or family member with cancer that makes you worried you might have cancer. Help us know that so that we can work around some of these issues. If you have an important performance coming up, well, you know, we might treat something differently than if there's you know, just routine voice use in the near future. Um, someone's expecting a child, well, you know, if somebody's pregnant, we're not necessarily going to engage the same uh, treatments. Um, similarly, someone's life is about to get a lot busier, we might be trying to get something in before that. Um, so those are all important uh, examples of how someone's life really affects what we do for, uh, for voice treatment. Um, so you know, after these busy slides, we go to just a few uh, simple things to think about. To help you manage information overload, some strategies that can help is to bring somebody with you. Um, ask if you can record the discussion. Use TeachBack, like I talked about before. Um, other than asking good questions, one of the most important things you can do is just repeat back to the team what your understanding is. And um, you know, we like to ask if, if we can, but if you just say, it, well, I understand you said that this is happening because of this reason, and you're recommending this is the next step. Just a simple thing like that gives us the chance to say that, yes, that's what we're recommending, or yes, except there's one little thing that I just want to clarify because clearly you know, the, it wasn't communicated uh, in, in the optimal way. Um, the, uh, and there's a lot of data in medical literature indicating that just talking through it helps patients solidify their own understanding uh, in addition to giving us the opportunity to correct uh, misunderstandings, and then asking for the key points or summary. And uh, you know, with Anjali here, we were talking about this yesterday. The other thing is her stopping me uh, when a patient has that glazed over look and saying, let's go back, and these are the key points here. And you know, we, we all do our best to explain things. We try to uh, read the patient. Different people have different levels of information seeking. And this audience, if you're here, obviously a higher end of information seeking. Some people just want to hear a couple things. Some people want to hear the whole spiel. I'd like to say that I'm really good at reading that. I'm not. Nobody is. Um, and uh, so I want to start by saying the most basics, but then I can keep going if you ask questions. And I'm sure other people, you know, everyone, we all have our own styles, but whoever you're seeing should uh, have a similar basic concept. 
Uh, and I'm going to close with uh, referring you to some resources. Now, obviously, uh, we have some information about conditions. So we all know one. Um, enthealth.org is uh, something that came from our um, academy. Uh, and it's a you know, patient-directed uh, health information site on all otolaryngologic problems. Um, and then the American Laryngologic Association uh, has uh, additional uh, laryngology-specific um, education. And there are certainly others, but it's important to have reliable sources. You can find anything, right? Um, and then this is something I want to highlight as well. This is use this or refer to it. Um, this is for all medical visits. The AHRQ I alluded to earlier, um, they have a lot of great resources, mostly for the healthcare community, but there's a patient-directed approach. Um, part of it was uh, part of the Choosing Wisely campaign. Consumer Reports was involved with it. Um, but uh, there's a whole um, questions are the answer campaign, uh, ways to be more engaged. So there's the 10 questions you should know that I put in there. But this Question Builder app, um, it, there's a, it's also on the website, not necessarily having to download the app. But it's, it's pretty cool. You actually go in, well, what's the point of this upcoming visit? What do you want to know? And you can ask, you know, list questions that uh, or categories of information that you want. And then it suggests questions for you to ask. And it actually will prompt you to list the three most important questions and then additional questions because sometimes you, know, you with limited time you may not get to everything and so it helps you focus on well, the other things would be nice but I need to have these questions answered and uh, then you can actually walk in with a printed sheet of paper or the questions on your phone so you can just bring that in and um, that can really help um, so you don't forget um, so bring it all together engage with your voice care team uh, prepare for the visit with uh, background information. Really have your goals in mind for what you want to achieve. Uh, ask questions and use some available resources. And as a lot of this is voice problem specific, but most of it is just general ways to engage uh, with the healthcare team. Well, thank you.